All right. Hey guys, this is Elise. Welcome back to the online event series, Catholic and Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. This is um, the Q&A video with my good friends, Micah and Catherine. All right, guys, so let's kick this off. Question one is from Susan, and she asks, how can we provide a platform to really hear our brothers and sisters of color and to hear what they're feeling and what they've experienced? And I'll turn this question over to Micah. That's, that's a good, uh, you know, I think that one of the most critical aspects I, you know, of of when you're wading into something that's new, and and for for anyone who who saw my introduction video, I uh, know that I came from a spot where I just simply didn't have people of color that were around me. You know, I, I came from Appalachian, Ohio, and you know w when you you something and and you want to be able to learn more, um, you play. But I, that I think has really grown in, in the last couple of months is our nation has been is seeking to really grasp a lot of uh, things from a policy aspect, but really also from a cultural aspect is there are things that we can be, uh, things that we can be doing and, and that we can be seeking out materials uh, that are becoming more available online. Uh, and, you know, whether it is forums like this, uh, where where we're able to uh, to seek out and talk to each other, uh, but also even YouTube. I mean, and I'm I'm serious. There are things out there. You're going to get a full range. There will be some things that are absolutely crazy, but a place that is very very uh, non threatening to be able to learn more is online. And and that's one thing that's very very different. And when you contrast it with say the civil rights movement, uh, where uh, that kind of information wasn't readily accessible. The next thing from there is I, uh, you know, certainly to, if you know anybody, I, uh, and, and I think that I, uh, given uh, where we are today as a country demographically, uh, there's a lot more access to someone that you know, someone that's in your circles, maybe you don't know well, you know, for me, my first real experience of this was I uh, actually sitting down with a, with a coworker. I, uh, and uh, we, we went out for drinks and I uh, started Josh saying, Josh, I'm going to admit right now, I'm an idiot when it comes to talking about race. And, and I, I always get really awkward about it because I don't know what's right. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's politically correct and what's not, but I just wonder if you'd be willing to share with me. And, and it was one of the most awkward conversations I've ever had because it was my first time being intentional about it. Um, but and I, it didn't answer all my questions in one night. Uh, and it didn't give me this incredible experience just at one time. But that was the beginning of, of a journey for me. Uh, and it started with making myself uncomfortable and doing it with someone. I was fortunate enough that Josh was one of those people that he was just really good about engaging and being very forgiving, being full of grace for me. Uh, and, and, and it's getting past our own internal barriers, our own fear uh, of being able to start a conversation like that. And we can do to give a platform for, for people of color to be able to just share their experience with us is simply to open yourself up to listen uh, and, and to actively offer yourself up in that way. And the opportunities that will come out of that are, you know, can be endless. It's really going to come down to what someone, uh, what someone wants for themselves uh, to be that vessel to receive uh, those kinds of conversations. Micah, thank you so much. I think that's so beautiful that you um, are highlighting that each person is a platform in and of themselves and that relationships are bridges and platforms so to speak as well whether it's a small one or a big one it's a platform thank you for that that's very insightful and so helpful it's really practical too anyone can access um, the next question comes from Megan and she asks how do you get people to have serious conversations about these hard topics when in general people have fewer conversations about easy things, let alone the hard stuff. And for this question, I'll turn it over to Catherine. Um, I appreciate this question, Megan, because it just seems like um, that is what we all struggle with, is how to have the conversation in the first place. And 
I think it comes down to a couple of factors that are the same for any hard conversation. So by generalizing it here, I am not trying to shift the conversation from race, but rather addressing these major aspects of having a difficult conversation, which include, I think, setting the right time and place for that conversation. Like, I love what Micah said, um, drinks with a coworker after work, it's a little bit more relaxed, it's the right time to bring up those more difficult questions. And I think that that's where we get hung up as we try to think about these conversations as a five minute deal in the middle of some other dinner party, which, you know, these, these conversations are so beautiful because they, they involve a sense of privacy and confidentiality. It's somebody's story, somebody's heart that they're sharing. And so it really does need a special environment and then one of the other pieces that I think makes it difficult is we're not ready to receive that information. Um, so for me, what it looks like um, is a couple of different things. So going into a tough conversation or one where I don't, I don't know how to react in it. Like you said, Mike, just feeling that awkwardness of what is, what is my role in this conversation? To sit back and I go to the Lord, um, I ask God for um, the humility, the wisdom, you know, trying to come from a place of being a gift to this person of I need to be there for what you need, which is a listener in this moment. And, um, and I think we, we need to have that space of silence, even if you're not a person of faith and reflection to just go inside for a moment and put yourself in the right place to receive somebody's story. Um, and third thing, I really appreciate when conversations are, um, are, are in the service of relationships. So it's not just to have the hard conversation, but also to let the person know that um, I'm here because I care about you. And everything you just told me, I may not fully get it, but regardless of, you know, this conversation, it doesn't change the fact that I still feel connected to you and we have a relationship. Whether that's said or not um, verbally or through body language, I just feel it's so important that somebody feels safe to continue sharing like that. Catherine, you are so beautiful. I love you. <laughs> And that's so touching. Um, yeah, so let, we'll circle back to a couple of these in a moment. Um, one other question that came for our little grouping is from Anonymous. These are pre-submitted questions um, by individuals online who know about this project, but they, um, you know, there's an opportunity to pre-submit questions for them with this project that they don't feel comfortable sharing with others. So the question that I'll be receive, that I'll be answering um, from anonymous is my concern is the quote unquote mob mentality when these things occur. Why is it that destruction of businesses, vehicles, fires, and criminal activity occurs? So I think that's a really good question. It's a common question, and it's a common concern of like, aren't we all in this together? And therefore why does it feel like some people don't want to be in it together and, and they want solutions from us, but then they don't want to be involved with us? Like it can cause confusion relationally um, and in community. So I, I think on this particular question, I'll put my therapist hat on and I'll try to explain. So for those that have experienced anything that is traumatic, you know, historically and, um, in popular culture, we think of trauma as just like someone jumps out of a bush and then they like rape someone or a, a, like a veteran of war or a prisoner of war who has seen active battle and um, or they're the victim of like a very aggressive burglary or physical assault. So like we normally think of just like those particular categories in popular culture. Trauma from a mental health perspective, from a um, bodily perspective of how the brain and the body processes information is anything that flips your world upside down 
to then make you no longer feel safe with the world as you saw it and the world as you assumed it to be. And this is a, this can be for a person across anywhere on the age, like lifespan. So an infant who experiences trauma is very, they, they could interpret their safe world in a certain type of way that is different than an individual who is 45 years old or 70 years old and what they think is a safe world that they have adapted to along the way. Either way, for whoever it is, depending on the factors that make up who they are, it, it, it helps to determine what is tr considered traumatic for them. So when an individual experiences trauma, their body and their brain responds with fight, flight, or freeze. And these are the most common responses. When there are compounded traumas, there's more than one, then it goes in the category of complex trauma, which has complex responses. To certain layers, their body may have responded with freeze, like, oh, I, I can't respond. And so, like, I can't say anything, I can't do anything. To another experience of trauma, they might respond with flight. They might try to run away. Another, another layer of trauma may be fight and become aggressive and to try to ward off the source of the trauma or the source of fear. Um, in times like this, where people are publicly protesting, they are expressing what is the most, um, the way that they're experiencing the thing that they're protesting. So certain people experience the thing that they're protesting as like a, um, as an opponent that they can deal with that there is room for just speech. And, um, and so they can address it through, um, through verbalizing and through talking. Certain people experience the thing that they're protesting as, I need to get out of Dodge. So they don't even get involved in the protest. They just try to get out. They try to leave town, whatever. Some people experience the thing that they're protesting about as um, something that they need to fight. Like, for whatever reason, whether it's because of those buildup of layers and they're like, I can't deal with this anymore and I need to show that I'm not willing to put up with this anymore, that this is no longer tolerated, so I'm going to be aggressive about it. Certain people show it that way. So, you know, I can't diagnose anyone <laughs> that I've never met. I can't pathologize people that are not my patients. That's out of the line for me. But what I can explain, given what I do, is that, um, Race, racial discrimination, especially those that are compounded experiences and then also violent experiences of racial discrimination can typically be traumatizing for individuals and cause them to fear, feel powerless or helpless and feel worthless as well. So when those things are tr experienced as traumatic, then they could have any of these three responses. And that would be something that would be considered normal to an abnormal experience. Um, abnormal is, and normal is different from what is common. So like, just because many people experience racism doesn't mean that it's quite normal for the bodily system of um, what makes a person healthy. So I hope that kind of helps um, to just get some, you know, pull some pieces together to make sense of it. At this time, I want to open up all three questions for um, our table, curious to hear, from both of you, Micah and Catherine, if you have any um, thoughts to add to the questions that each of us have individually addressed, or um, even on your own, the question that you received, if you have some additional thoughts as well. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Well, I, you know, one of the things that has stood out to me too, and you know, because I've I've been in the conversations I've been having with uh, with friends and, and family, and over the last month or so, I, you know, one of the things that does get asked a lot about is, well, what about the rioting? You know, what what about the damage? What about you know, here in the city of Columbus, uh, for anyone who goes downtown, uh, you know, there's a lot of boarded up windows. Uh, they just started replacing some of the glass this week downtown. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of questions about, around that. And, you know, and I, I thought that what you touched on uh, is very valid because a lot of people have a hard time putting themselves in that mindset uh, just because it doesn't fit their experiences, doesn't fit anything that they've ever been part of. I mean, 
I, you know, typically when we say first world problems, we mean that in, in a jocular manner, but I mean, this, this is a, this is a real thing for, for people who have never experienced that kind of, of trauma in their lives. I, it, anyone, uh, the other thing I think it's really important to remember as well is I, uh, that there is, I, uh, there are elements in, in our country um, across the entire political spectrum who will not let a, a flashball moment uh, go to waste. And, and they will actively work to hijack a movement. Um, and I, I think a really good example of this is actually what happened out in, in Denver, Colorado, because their arrest records and the interviews that they did uh, after that first weekend of, of rioting showed that people that they were arresting, and you had everything from Antifa to Bugaloo boys. I, you know, so I mean, you got far, far left, far, far right I, that were trying to take the advantage of, of a very chaotic and noisy moment um, for, to further and create more noise because it's that kind of, of violence that helps them get a platform that they wouldn't have otherwise as well. And, and so, you know, I think that what's important for people that are left confused and, and questioning about that, no matter what the motivation may be to create that kind of violence in the first place for whoever it was, whether there's people that are, they're, they're acting that way because it's the only way that they know how to express I, themselves and with, uh, with racial discrimination or if it's other political ideologies, for those who don't understand it, one, we don't have to, we don't have to understand it. I, you know, we, we do have to have a moment though of saying, do we want, and, and I, you know, just this past week, I, I got to speak at a, at a black church up in, in Youngstown. Um, and, and we were talking about where do we go from here? I, you know, what, what can we do that's meaningful uh, from a policy perspective? And I, you know, one of the questions that we asked, we had a really great conversation around this is a year from now, when, when our community leaders, our elected officials, and each other, when we think of George Floyd, do we want to think of riots and autonomous zones? Or do we want to think of something that started meaningful conversations where a lot of people opened up for the first time talking to each other and working on making structural changes to some things that we've all known was broken for a while, we just didn't realize how it was impacting everybody else. And, and so if, if for those who are afraid of the violence, who are afraid of the destruction, that's okay. That's okay as well. You don't have to understand it. What is important is you recognize the difference between right and wrong and that you engage in those conversations because that's what will ultimately make the difference. If we just recoil from and say, no, I don't want to have anything to do with this discussion because of what's happening that I don't understand, that's how we're going to lose this moment and how a year from now, this was all lost and for nothing. Thank you so much. That's super encouraging and um, definitely calls, you know, each person to self-investigate what their responses are and, and to also do it in a way that is self-honoring to respect each, each other's pace of taking in information and doing things in a way that, you know, they don't have to be in control. They don't have to understand everything. And, but trying to is a beautiful gesture. Um, so given that Catherine is one of my best friends, I can see your gears worrying that there are things going through your mind. And I am curious, what is on your mind? <laughs> <laughs> well, not, not, not so much my own thoughts, but I just love, um, I think the two of you um, have some very valuable points that I haven't heard enough in this conversation. I just really appreciate you bringing up the trauma piece and also the fact that it's okay to be uncomfortable um, from, from whatever experience, but it's what you do with that discomfort. And so I, I appreciate this mix of questions because I think they all build on each other. There's the dealing with the, uncomfort, the uncomfortable experience of this is unfamiliar to me, then there's creating platforms and then there's individual engagement. And I think with each of those stages, um, some of us might find um, different platforms more fitting to where they are right now. But I think it's important for everyone to know that all three of those things need to happen ultimately. Um, and I really appreciate the fact that 
there's people like the two of you who are sharing your wisdom too. Oh, thank you, Catherine. I love, I love this. And um, yeah, it's so much fun to do this with friends. You know, it doesn't have to be threatening. It doesn't have to be scary for friends to do. And um, I think at this point, if it's okay with you guys, um, I, I'm, I have, I'm going to give a chance for one more like comment or observation before closing this particular video. Um, any other concluding thoughts that you guys have? I think that the only thing I would add is the, the theme across all three of these questions uh, is conversation uh, and, and talking. And uh, you know, right now it's really easy for people to turn to social media and to, uh, and to think that because they're putting out a message that so many people can read or, or because they're, they're reading something that they can click like or they can give a response and and it's not uh, picking up the phone you know or you know as as we uh, experience ebbs and flows around coronavirus of being able to whether it's a zoom meeting or if it's i uh, getting together i uh, in person and socially distancing uh, wh whatever the meeting may be we cannot replace actual voice communication and and that's how we can do uncomfortable things I, and so across all three of these questions, I, and I don't know if you did it on purpose or if it was an accident, I, the theme is communication and we have to communicate. Well, knowing Elise, these questions were put together intentionally because that's how, that's how she does things. So thank you, Elise, for um, organizing this so well. Thank you so much. Um, you caught me in my game. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, I hope that this video, for those who do get to see it, um, that it inspires you, that it encourages you to guys uh, to start some conversations with the important people in your life, whether it's having questions or wanting to share something you experienced or just to help make this topic a little less scary and more approachable. And with that, we just wish you all God bless. <laughs>